And also remember, do not put us on hold because sometimes when you put the calls on hold, you hear the background music and things. So please use star six to mute your line. Um, after Dr. Bauer speaks, you can always use star seven to unmute your line. So once again, today our speaker is Dr. Hattie Bauer. And uh, Dr. Bauer is the California STD Control Branch Chief. She received her MD from UC San Francisco and her MS and MPH degrees from UC Berkeley. She's been in the field of STD for 15 years and definitely is considered a national ex expert in the area of sexual health and STB, STD prevention. So we're very happy to have her. Remember, promptly following the call, there will be a brief evaluation survey. So please take a few minutes to complete that directly after the call. And once again, if you have any additional topics for It's Your Call, I would love to get those via email or on the evaluation after the call. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bauer. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. We can. All right. Great. So I'm curious, uh, logistically, if I can tell from the ReadyTalk uh, interface who's actually on the call, or do you guys know? Or is it I can see who's on the call. Oh, you can? Oh. Yes. Yeah. All right, well, good. <laughs> yes, I can't. <laughs> uh, and that's a part truth, part lie. Some people's names come up and others just their phone numbers. <laughs> that's funny. All right. Well, I want to let folks know that if you if you don't have the handout in front of you, it's not absolutely essential. This isn't working. I'm gonna I'm gonna use the handout just to guide sort of um, the organization of no, some of the know. points I want to make, but it's not Sorry. it's not essential that I'm you're not, following I along. I signed up like two times on NCFD and I still don't get any other emails. Folks at NCSD, I can hear your conversation. I don't know if you want to put yourself on mute or if you want me to wait. There are some people on the line. Can you please make sure you put your lines on mute, either mute or using star six, because we can hear some background. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so my hope today is just to talk for a few minutes about what's going on in California and some of the issues that come up around EPT for gonorrhea in particular given the emerging antibiotic resistance concerns and the latest treatment guideline update which really emphasizes intramuscular injectable um, ceftriaxone as opposed to the oral cephalosporins. And of course, we have to use oral medications for expedited partner treatment. And so, you know, where does that leave us in terms of giving folks options for getting partners treated? So just by way of background, um, in California, we actually made a legislative change in 2001 that specifically allowed patient-delivered partner treatment for chlamydia. And then in 2007, we got another opportunity um, to expand the language of that original chlamydia PDPT, and we were able to add gonorrhea and quote unquote other STDs as determined by the department. And in fact, in 2012, we expanded our guidelines to cover trichomoniasis. So right now in California, um, PDPT or expedited partner therapy is allowable for chlamydia, gonorrhea, and, and trich. And those guidelines, if anyone's interested in taking a look at the guidelines, they're available on our website the quickest way to get to our website is um, std.ca.gov, and that should link to our program page, and you can follow the links to guidelines. Or you can just look up, you can Google, you know, PDPT California guidelines, and it's probably one of the first hits that comes up. So um, what about, you know, EPT in general and gonorrhea? And I think we have to remember the rationale for why we're looking at EPT in the first place. Um, and I think we just recognize, particularly in California, we don't have a lot of health department funds at the local level to do follow-up on chlamydia and gonorrhea cases. And so we really wanted to be able to give clinics an option to do EPT since for the most part they weren't contacting partners and they weren't referring those patients or partners to the health department unless there was some um, some exceptional situation where the patient wasn't treated or was a very high-risk patient. 
Um, we know the medication is safe and effective, and there's lots and lots of data now. I think there's been six randomized controlled trials looking at how EPT can improve partner notification, partner treatment for chlamydia, gonorrhea, urethritis, trichomonas, a um, uh, number of different trials out there looking at, in particular, reinfection rates in the index patient. So a lot of evidence to support this practice. And um, we also know from surveys and other kind of uh, practice-based um, practice research that it's acceptable to patients, and for the most part, it's appreciated as an option by both providers and patients. <laughs> Um, in the slides, and I'm not going to go into detail, I do provide one example of the Matt Golden's study that was published in New England Journal that showed reduced reinfection rates for gonorrhea and chlamydia. And, and that was one of the few studies that looked at both gonorrhea and chlamydia. And what was remarkable is that the impact of EPT on gonorrhea was striking. It, they Folks went from 11% reinfection rates down to 3% reinfection rates. And of course, this was back in a time that we weren't concerned about emerging antibiotic resistance. And so maybe, you know, maybe those numbers would change now as the MICs creep up to some of the oral cephalosporins. But I doubt that we're going to redo those trials in this new era. So um, I think everyone knows that the current gonorrhea treatment recommendations, ceftriaxone 250 intramuscular in a single dose, and then that with dual therapy, either azithromycin one gram, which is preferred, or the doxy uh, 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. Now, the guidelines do allow uh, oral cephalosporins, but they really emphasize that, you know, IM treatment is not an option. And in that case, they recommend uh, suffixing 400 plus azithromycin. And so you're still getting that, that dual treatment. In the slide handouts, I provide a couple of tables looking at treatment efficacy, and I'm not going to go over those data in detail. But one of the things that I think is striking, I was actually in the group um, for the 2010 treatment guidelines that looked at chlamydia and gonorrhea and other related syndromes. And so we reviewed the efficacy data in some detail. And I think what's remarkable is that all of these drugs that we consider for gonorrhea treatment, including the oral cephalosporins, have very high efficacy in clinical trials. Now again, these clinical trials could be out of date if we start to see reduced efficacy for oral cephalosporins because of increased MICs. These numbers may not be valid anymore. But when the trials were done, efficacy rates were anywhere from 97, 98, 99 percent. And very few studies have looked at the dual therapy, the suffixine plus azithromycin together. Um, the one study that did look at it for pharyngeal infection actually found fairly high uh, efficacy rate. So I think we're fairly confident based on the drug trials that these drugs are very well, uh, very effective and very well tolerated by, by patients. And the one caveat is with pharyngeal gonorrhea, which is sort of notoriously difficult to treat, and you do see drops in those efficacy rates for pharyngeal gonorrhea. So we'll come back to this in thinking about expedited partner treatment since often with the partner, you're not going to know um, where they're infected, and you may know where they were exposed, and if they were exposed pharyngeally, you may you know, think about it differently in terms of how effective is the oral cephalosporin going to be for a, a throat infection. Um, so I think I, the other thing in, in the slides that I included, um, the graph that was published in the MMWR last August that essentially just showed higher and higher MICs for suffixing over time. and. Um, and again, this was data from GIST, the Gonococcal Isolate Surveillance Project. 
and they looked at 2006 through August of 2011, which was the 2011 data that they had available. And what you can see is that the MICs went from very, very low, you know, zero in many cases for, for years, up to um, almost 1%, and then they're creeping up to almost 2%. And so significantly increases over time. And this is a concern because EPT is going to be with um, suffixime. And so if the MICs are increasing, how effective is EPT going to be? So what are some of the concerns specifically? One I mentioned already with pharyngeal infections that may not be cured with the suffixime regimen. A second issue is that infections that are caused by isolates that are resistant or have higher MICs to oral cephalosporin may remain untreated. And obviously, we're not seeing the partner. We're not testing the partner. We don't know where they're infected. We don't know anything about the bug that they may be infected with. And so um, that's a real concern. Another concern that's been raised around using oral cephalosporins in general is that it may actually contribute to the emergence of antimicrobial resistance. And I think there's some data that isolates that are exposed to oral cephalosporins have genetic mechanisms uh, for mutation, and actually you can induce resistance or higher MICs level just by exposing these bugs to oral cephalosporins. And so that's a concern, just that you know, if we continue to use these drugs and they're used pervasively as partner treatment, are we actually contributing to the problem of emerging drug resistance? And um, so I'm going to put that out there just as a potential concern. And you know, I think. Um, Somebody somewhere along the way, I'm not sure with CDC, but there's discussion of recommending test of cure for partners, which is great, except that you have to imagine if, you know, EPT is a last resort, partner's not coming in for care, they're not willing to get tested, they're not even willing to come in for treatment, how likely is it that they're going to come into a clinic setting for a test of cure? And I think in, in general, most people look at that and feel that that's, that's pretty, it's a long shot and it's pretty unlikely that that's going to be a way to monitor the effectiveness of EPT for gonorrhea. So let's look at the other side of the coin. Um, and first of all, just to be clear, the GCEPT on our guidelines and CDC guidelines is suffixime 400 milligrams plus azithromycin one gram. And if you play with some of the efficacy data, what you can figure out is that let's take a worst case scenario where that's only the lower limit of the efficacy for those drugs, which is about 95% and 75% for pharyngeal infection. And the reality is that if you limit your use of EPT for gonorrhea to cases that wouldn't otherwise be treated, you're at least going to be treating, you know, 75 to 95 percent of infections in partners based on what we know currently about the efficacy. So I think our feeling in California has long been that it's better than nothing. It's got some limitations. There are some concerns out there. But in a situation where the partner would have otherwise gone completely untreated, continued to spread the infection, potentially get a complication from having the infection, that giving providers, empowering them with the ability to provide medication or a prescription for medication is better than nothing. It's better than just leaving uh, partners high and dry without any access to treatment. The other thing that we try to do in California through our guidelines and through the educational materials that are given to partners is we try to encourage them to get a clinical evaluation. So the message is even if, you know, go ahead and take this medication, but even if you take this medication, you should still see a provider. You should still be tested for other STDs. You might need a test of cure. You might need an HIV test and really trying to use that opportunity when they receive the medication or they receive the information to drive them into care so that they can get a full range of STD services that would be appropriate. 
Um, I think I mentioned our guidelines and the website is std.ca.gov. Hopefully that will work. Otherwise you can send me an email if you have trouble finding it, and I'd be happy to, to send you the links. And in the California guidance document, um, we really emphasize that EPT for GC, or anything else for that matter, should not be first-line strategy. That it really should be available as a tool to treat partners with uh, partners of GC positive patients when other treatment options aren't feasible or aren't effective or um, it's just there's no other way to get the partner treated. Um, we also uh, really emphasize clinical evaluation and it was um, a study that was done here in California that we coined the term BYOP, bring your own partner, which has gotten some traction um, at the national level. And what this was is when we started working with family planning clinics, in our family planning program in California, they're able to enroll males. And so the clinics were being very proactive when they would call a patient to let her know that her test was positive. They basically told her that when she comes in for treatment, she should just bring her partner with her. And it was a very effective strategy, particularly for patients who were in long-term relationships, committed relationships, they would just bring partners with them. The partners could enroll in the family planning program and then get their medication and their care for free. And obviously really high rates of um, treatment in that group. Um, some of the other highlights from our guidelines really emphasizing dual treatment and we think that um, although there's not a lot of research data that I'm aware of, but we think that that added azithromycin with the cefixime really has a powerful impact on reducing the likelihood of emerging drug resistant and also increasing the efficacy of the oral cephalosporin treatment. And so that's, that's also very strongly um, emphasized. Now we do have precautions related to the use of oral cephalosporins and especially among men who have sex with men, um, partly because there's not a lot of trial data uh, with MSM using EPT for gonorrhea or chlamydia, partly because of concerns that have been raised about um, unidentified or undiagnosed HIV infection. And there was a study that was done a number of years ago, Joanne Steckler, I believe, uh, looking at folks who came in as contacts and found a reasonably high rate, I think it was around 5% of, of undiagnosed HIV infection in MSM. And that has been, that was the impetus for CDC to not recommend EPT for MSM. Um, and then the, the last concern is with the higher likelihood of pharyngeal infection. And so it's a population that um, has been demonstrated in research to have high rates of pharyngeal gonorrhea infection. And that's not going to be treated as well with the EPT. And so, you know, my interest in California is not to curtail providers' ability to make the best decision they can make on behalf of their patients and their patients' partners. And so what we've done in our guidelines is just to caution providers about some of the concerns and using EPT, but not, we didn't ask them to limit their use just to, you know, ensure that the counseling messages are um, very strong in, in getting folks in for care to get HIV tests or to get a test of cure or on the material that goes out to the partner, it, it, would, it says in it that, you know, if they had um, an exposure in their throat, the medication may not work as well and they still need to see a provider. So there's a lot of um, sort of information that goes out to providers and to patients and to partners emphasizing some of these various points. Um, and, and then, you know, just again trying to drive people into care, making sure that they get clinical referrals, that they know where they can access care that's convenient and inexpensive and that you know, that's really the best thing for their health. Um, in the August 2012 MMWR, so the CDC created an update to their GC treatment guidelines that were published originally in December 2010, and the update really eliminated um, oral cephalosporins as an alternative therapy for gonorrhea. 
But they did have a quote in this MMWR from August of 2012 that basically said if a heterosexual partner, and again, the CDC really only endorses EPT for heterosexuals, if a heterosexual partner of a patient cannot be linked to evaluation and treatment in timely fashion, then expedited partner therapy should be considered using oral combination antimicrobial therapy for gonorrhea, suffixine 400 milligrams and azithromycin 1 gram delivered to the partner by the patient, a disease uh, investigation specialist, or through a collaborating pharmacy. And so it's, um, there's a lot of cautions around using EPT for GC, but the CDC <laughs> generally endorses it. And again, under specific circumstances where partners wouldn't otherwise be treated and um, they're heterosexual. So I wanted to stop there, and I, NCSD came up with some wonderful discussion questions that we worked on together, and those were um, posted, I believe, earlier. But some of the questions, um, how has EPT been implemented in your jurisdiction for chlamydia, gonorrhea, other STDs? How have the new treatment guidelines impacted gonorrhea control in your jurisdiction? What can NCSD do at the national level to support EPT for gonorrhea? and what best practices, procedures regarding EPT can be shared. So if folks want to unmute lines and just maybe we can have a discussion about this and share information or ask questions, that would be great. Hey, Heidi. Yes. Thanks. This is Dana. Thanks for the great talk. Before you move forward with uh, Q&A and discussion, can you define, uh, well, can you discuss minim minimum inhibitory concentration? And dis discuss the MICs. A couple of questions came across in the chat about what is that and what does that mean. Oh, absolutely. And I'm, I'm sorry. I think I'm, I'm not able to see the chat. My chat box is empty. <laughs> so I'm glad, I'm glad you're getting some, some chat questions. So, so MIC, Bob Kirkaldi did this wonderful presentation at the last NCSD meeting where he had these wonderful visuals and showed basically what they do is they take antibiotic and they dilute it down to lower and lower concentrations and they grow the bug in the presence of antibiotic. And obviously really high concentrations of antibiotics are going to kill the bug completely. But as you get lower and lower and lower, the bug is going to survive. So the MIC really measures at what level of antibiotic is the bug able to survive. And so as the numbers increase, and so if you have an MIC of 0.25 or 0.5 or 1, the bigger the number, the higher the concentration of antibiotic that those bugs are able to survive. And the way that they're surviving is through genetic changes that make them resistant. And so every antibiotic has a different mechanism of action where it you know, attacks the cell wall or it attacks some enzyme. And what the bug can do is actually mutate, change some of the, the protein, the shapes of the proteins and the compositions of cell walls so that they can survive even in the presence of those antibiotics. And so that's basically what minimum inhibitory concentration, it's the concentration of antibiotic that will inhibit the growth of the bacteria. And of course we want, we want those numbers to be as low as possible because we, we don't want to have to keep moving the dose up and up and up for the drugs that we have available, and I, I think everyone's heard this before, the cephalosporins are really our last line of defense. We've blown through penicillins and tetracyclines and fluoroquinolones with ciprofloxacin um, being the most recent loss, and, and spectinomycin is probably still effective, but it's not available to purchase in this country, and so unfortunately that's not even an option. And so. Um, we, are, we are quickly running out of classes of antibiotics that we're going to be able to use to fight this infection. And whoever asked the MIC question, um, please let me know if that made sense and if, if you need more information. Great. Thanks, Heidi, for of describing that for us and defining that down. Questions, comments for Dr. Bauer? This is Elizabeth Lebo in Maryland. We're, we are slowly, slowly moving towards EPT in Maryland. It's um, 
already done um, in a limited fashion just in two SCD clinics in Baltimore City. But in terms of thinking about expanding it statewide through regs, we would not have to necessarily change statute. We're still very concerned about including GC because we're still finding cases where private providers are treating inappropriately and still using suffixime. So we still haven't even done a thorough job of getting the message out to providers about the use of ceftriaxone as a preferred first-line treatment. And so we're worried that, you know, this would – you know, if we start start down the road to EPT and include gonorrhea, that we'd be giving a mixed message to providers mm -hmm. since they haven't gotten the first message. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, I understand, you know, you've done a lot of work in California especially um, with patient and provider education and partner education, but have you found that there's a, you know, there are mixed messages and providers are confused? I think I think that's a great point and it's I've certainly, you know, had people raise that before. Usually it's raised from, you know, the patient's confusion. So the patient goes in, they get a shot and then they're given oral medication to take to their partner and they say, "Hey, <laughs> why did I have to get a shot and and my partner only has to take, you know, these pills and why can't I just have the pills?" And so, you know, I I I hear that come up. It's usually um, explained well by clinicians who will just say, well, actually the shot is better, but, you know, if what you're telling me is that your partner's not going to get treated and not going to come into clinic, this is kind of a backup mm -hmm. that's not as effective, but it's better than nothing, and in most cases um, will cure the infection. And so, you know, you can kind of frame it that way. Um, the latest data that we have in California, we're, we're one of the sun sites participating mm -hmm. in the sort of enhanced gonorrhea surveillance, and so we get some additional information on a random sample of gonorrhea patients. And I think our rates of perfect appropriate treatment, which is the IM ceftriaxone and azithromycin or doxy, is running around 78%, mm. which I think is really, really good. That's I mean, great. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what my expectation was. Last year it was about 64%, and of course, you know, last year was just one year after the guidelines came out. Um, and we're doing some work now with provider surveys to really understand what the barriers are, because I think you know, there is a barrier of just not realizing that the guideline changed, that, you know, just isn't about education. But there's also in many clinic settings a barrier that they just can't provide on-site IM treatment. Right. Um, they just write prescriptions for medications or they can refer people for treatment. And so um, I think it's a minority of clinics and certainly they're not diagnosing a large proportion of gonorrhea. But those are going to be challenging situations to really, you know, we can emphasize using IM treatment till we turn blue, but if they right. can't get those meds into their clinic and they can't build that capacity in their clinic, it's going to be really challenging. But, you know, I think you raise a really good point, and I think, I think it is a concern and it is a reality that um, you're saying, you know, if you have the person in front of you, you want to do IM treatment, but, you know, again, it's, EPT for gonorrhea, I think, is just, it's a last resort or should be considered a last resort. But yeah, they're nuanced. They're difficult messages because they're nuanced. I give providers a fair amount of credit to understand complexities just because, you know, there's a lot of aspects of medicine that are fairly complicated. And so, you know, I don't feel like we need to dumb everything down. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm, I I know that you have uh, rolled things out sort of piecemeal in, in Baltimore and, and doing some nice evaluation in Baltimore. So um, can you tell the group sort of what some of the outcomes have been with the pilot work? Well, it's going to be very – I mean, Baltimore has been up and running for probably five years now, if I'm not mistaken, but it is a separate project area, so it's not um, – oh. you know, we were not involved in the design implementation or evaluation. But it's done very well. Um, I've got some really interesting um, information and literature and materials I can send to someone to distribute to everyone. Uh, Liz Temkin, as a part of her doctoral dissertation, did a really fascinating qualitative study of asking 
patients who received EPT for their partners, and these were blister packs of meds that were given out in the two Baltimore City STD clinics, and she was actually looking at what was, you know, what were the experiences of patients who took the blister packs of meds home to their partners? Was there any, were there issues with domestic violence when they, you know, brought these meds home and, and basically notified their partners uh -huh. um, that they had been infected and that the partners might need this medication? Did the pills wind up on the streets? Did they go down the toilet? Were they safe for later? <laughs> um, so it's very compelling oh, qualitative study. I'm happy to, it's been published, so I'm happy to distribute it. And um, we pulled together a stakeholders work group with, with a lot of help and support from the Baltimore City Project, finding out what the lessons learned were from Baltimore City, which is, granted, you know, it's one city, and they only are doing EPT in their two public health clinics. They are not, it is not, um, it's not pharmacy-based, it's not prescriptions, and okay. it's not private providers, so it's very um, limited in its, in its framework. Mm -hmm. um, they've had great success. Um, I think their repeat infection rates have gone down. Um, I can get you all that information, wow. but if That's anyone's great. interested, one of the things we did as part of our um, kind of an environmental scan of looking at who needs to be involved in assessing implementation of EBT in Maryland, we pulled together a group of stakeholders ranging from our boards of pharmacy, physicians, and um, nurses to folks from the hospital association and professional medical societies, public health, all sorts of folks, researchers, and people, and a lot of people from Baltimore City who'd been very instrumental in running the EPT program there. So we put together with some professional facilitators lists of questions like to, which infections to include or exclude, hmm. which, which populations to include or exclude, which, what are the costs. So we have a final report that we put out, and, and that may be something we can share, and it may give people a template if they're considering moving forward in their own states and haven't yet implemented EPT. And we had a lot of help from Matt Hogben. We invited him up oh, to give great. a presentation on sort of the national genesis of EPT and um, lessons learned from other states, and interestingly, Heidi, he, um, um, we were told that in California, because we were concerned about adverse reactions, which, by the way, there have been none of in Baltimore City, California, as the oldest program, had installed, I guess you folks set up a hotline, and you yeah. were amazed for the first six um. months that there were absolutely no calls until you realized the phones were not plugged in. <laughs> I oh, thought yeah, that John was a, a wonderful uh, lesson yeah, learned. Yeah. Again, yeah. Even over the following nine and a half years, you still had no and no adverse reactions that were reported to your hotline, which is right. great. Right. Well, we yeah we started out with a with a toll free hotline, and oh. then that costs money, it turns mm -hmm. out. And so we funded that for the first few years, mm -hmm. and we never got a call. Well, and might. I know there was a point in time when no one was actually monitoring the hotline because no yeah, one was assigned, but still there yeah. was nothing or there. Or you might want to put two on it. because okay. it's kind of And now it. the, the reporting main, system is through and email, and, oh. and so all the, any and emails that. that might come in through the reporting system okay. actually roll over into my email. The email says fax. Okay, I'm going to say something. Yeah, I mean, her letter says fax. One of the things in the Baltimore City EPT pilot project that I thought was interesting is that um, in my personal conversations with their clinicians, they have not been, at least up until a year ago, they were not including adolescents in their EPT program because they were not trusting um, kind of the information that the, the original patients were giving them about risk factors, risk behaviors, partners, and so they were excluding adolescents from EPT, which, you know, as we all know, is one of the biggest, you know, that's where the burden of disease really is. Yeah. So adolescents and young adults. So um, I'm not sure what's happening with that um, now, whether they're going to be changing that or not. Um, and we also don't know if we do wind up implementing EPT in Maryland at, this, at the whole, you know, for the whole state, how that might affect the particular pilot project that's been going on for over five years now in Baltimore City. We don't know whether they would then start you know, also using prescriptions and including pharmacies and private providers or whether they would still stick with their two, the only right. two public STD clinics that are part of the health department there. Right. Liz? Yeah. This is Dana. If you want to send me that, um, I can send it out to folks who are registered for this call. Oh, that's great. So I'll send you Liz Temkin's article, the qualitative study, and then um, some of the other, I, I we we'll probably have to get permission, but we had presentations from our 
commissioner for the Board of Pharmacy and from Matt Hogban and from two folks in Baltimore City who run the EPT program there, but they're very interesting. And um, from my perspective, I'd be happy to share with you the, the, the questions we asked and, and sort of the resources we used. Great. That would so be I'll great. I'll figure out how to get that to you as a package after I get permission from the people whose <laughs> presentations okay. are included in there. All right. Thanks, Dana. That's great. Thank you. Other questions, comments for Dr. Bauer? Well, this is Elizabeth again. I don't want to hog the line, but if no one else is asking, I do have a question about, um, about evaluation. How in the world does one evaluate um, uptake and, I mean, it sounds like there's not necessarily a need to evaluate um, adverse reactions to the medications, but, you know, in terms of tracking, are you, is anyone just kind of leaving that aside? You know, it's, it's incredibly challenging. We got, a, a number of years ago, we got some special additional funding from CDC to do an evaluation. Mm -hmm. And as part of that evaluation, and this has been published, we had an EIS officer, Ying Ying Yu, who published this um, for us in STD. And um, we contacted the patients, basically enrolled them in this evaluation, contacted them a week later and then three weeks later. Uh, and then ask them to provide us with their partner's contact information so that we can verify, you know, the information that they told us. It was incredibly resource intensive mm -hmm. to do that. And it was, for us, it was really a one, a one time, you know, evaluation that we had one time funds to look at things like, you know, what was the, what was the self-reported rates of notification, which were, um, very high. They were actually over 80% for the EPT group. It, it, was, it was interesting working with the clinics because we tried to recruit clinics that said they were using a lot of EPT and um, they, in the end, they tended to really overestimate their use because when we enrolled chlamydia positive clients, still almost, I think maybe half of them were still getting just patient referral. So even though EPT was available, um, it wasn't being, you know, used routinely, I think, for a lot of clients that may have benefited. And so the, the overall rate of actual reported partner treatment was just over 50%, which was kind of horrifying to me because I just thought, wow, well, if, we're, if we're only treating half of well, partners of well, patients yeah, that we're no, diagnosing, no. you know, chlamydia, no, no, it's no wonder that, you know, we're not making a big oh. dent in this epidemic. Yeah, yeah. because usually we find something and go off. Happy. Folks on the line, we're hearing a lot of background noise, and I can't mute all lines since people are asking questions. Please mute your phones. Thanks, Dana. Um, Anyway, we did find that the two most effective methods for getting partner treat, partners treated were EPT and then the BYOP, the, you know, bring your own partner into the clinic. Um, but that, you know, that study was probably a couple hundred thousand dollars. It took, you know, several people, you know, helping out with interviews and doing follow-up chart reviews. And, and you just can't do that, obviously, on a regular basis. And, and theoretically, it's not really warranted. But the other thing that you, you raise, I think, um, is in the recent discussions of the FOA, um, there's a lot of caveats around what direct clinical services we can pay for with um, CDC dollars. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole section that deals with, you know, we can contract it out to a clinic that provides services. And Gail Bolin on the last um, FOA call talked about how we can use the funds to buy test kits, we can use the funds to buy medication. But she made it very clear that we need to track and we need to verify that the only people receiving these services and medications and tests are people that are uninsured or underinsured. Right. And so we sort of looked at that and thought, well, that's going to be really tricky <laughs> because it, it's going to mean, you know, for the clinics that we provide partner packs to, which we've been doing for a number of years, mm -hmm. and, you know, over 100,000 doses of azithromycin have gone out all over the state of California. Mm -hmm. And we've just asked clinics to track the numbers, you know, just sort of the aggregate numbers of you know, how it's used and who, who it's provided for and any kind of, you know, any sort of observational outcomes. 
But we don't track you know, individual information on individual partners that may or may not receive the medication. And you know, there's some likelihood, I think, that some of it goes to waste, some of it's never delivered, okay. some of it's delivered but never taken. Mm-hmm. And so really tracking that and ensuring that the only people receiving it are under, un, underinsured or uninsured is going to be incredibly difficult. Mm-hmm. And so we've been trying to wrap our heads around how we can keep our PDPT program alive in this sort of new climate of, you know, stricter control over how we're spending dollars for direct clinical services. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I think you probably know that even in Baltimore, I'm sure the STD clinics have a tracking log where they keep track in the patient's charts and maybe even separately when they're giving out EPT under what circumstances, how many packs per person, right. and then if they can track reinfection rates, that's fantastic. Um, San Francisco STD Clinic did an analysis, and in their charts they have whether somebody received EPT, and they didn't really see much of a difference in, in overall aggregate reinfection rates mm-hmm. di- you know, that was differed between people receiving EPT versus not. And I think the main limitation there is that there are some, some biases in that you know, who receives EPT versus who doesn't, and you know there may be some selection bias that would make it so that folks receiving EPT might be more likely to get reinfected. Right. So it's it is really really challenging both to just track you know where it goes and who gets it, and to track um, you know any kind of outcomes. Well, especially if GC resistance is uh, you know growing, and it is growing in here to stay. So. You know, if you're using, if you're giving a patient a prescription or two or three to take back home to partners one, two, and three, and they turn it in at the pharmacy, and all it says on it is EPT, which may be what we do, um, you're still not necessarily going to be able to tie that prescription, that receipt of EPT, right. back to whether there was a repeat infection in whoever that client was. So yeah. it's tough. No, I think, yeah, I think it's really tough. Um, the California Family Health Council at one point, they sent out, they wanted to sort of get feedback on the program from partners, and they sent out the, the medication with a survey, and the survey was incentivized so that if they turned in the survey, I think they would automatically get, you know, a $20 gift certificate or something. And even with that, the response rate was incredibly low. I think it was less than 10%. And it may be because, you know, people don't want to out themselves as having an STD and having received PDPT and even for a $20, you know, incentive, we weren't able to collect any kind of reliable evaluation data on what happened to this medication. Was it taken? Did the person actually go in for services? Did they read the material? (laughs) You know, I mean, just all those questions that I think we would love to know the answer to and the study that we did, only about 17% of the women in our study even gave us any kind of partner contact information. And so we were only able to verify information on 17% of partners. And of course, the bias is that the women who provided that information have, you know, they have a different relationship with those partners that they feel comfortable giving their names to, you know, study staff and sort of interfacing between us and their partners. And so they were they were all, you know, much more likely to be in long term relationships, much more likely to live together, um, and in short, just not a generalizable representative sample of, of partners receiving EPT. Mm. So it's challenging. It's really challenging. Anyone else? This is your time, your opportunity. <laughs> yeah, this is Donna in Alaska. Hey Donna. Hi Donna. Hi. I've got just a couple of uh, things to share uh, from our Alaskan experience. Um, One was that we did, when we originally uh, uh, put out the recommendations on doing EPT in Alaska, which was, I think, January of 2011, we did try to track EPT. Um, We had changed our uh, provider reporting form to uh, to reflect uh, if there were any uh, EPT prescriptions associated with the um, with the index patient, um, how many prescriptions were written or, or orders of medication were put out, 
and um, and uh, we solicited as best we could um, information on who those partners were. Um, we did a lot of follow up initially, and as was mentioned before, it is very labor intensive, and this is a lot of DIS time trying to track down. Uh, how many people uh, actually took the medicine or got the prescription filled and those kinds of things. And uh, we really couldn't come up with any data because we weren't doing this really consistently. But in our experience, probably only about half of the partners actually received the medications and mm -hmm. took them. Uh, a lot of the difficulty was around um, prescriptions being written or called into pharmacies. Um, uh, for a lot of the patients, there was a uh, cost uh, that was associated that they couldn't afford it or they felt they couldn't afford it. There were transporta transportation issues. So we ended up uh, doing a lot of field treatment ourselves um, to try to fill that gap. But um, um, the, uh, the model that we came up with that we're experimenting with right now is a pharmacy-based model. We have a contract with a pharmacy right here in Anchorage. Uh, they also happen to do all of our ADAP meds. Um, this is an infusion pharmacy where they have the capability of giving injections. And this is a big part of why we uh, decided to try this is that uh, providers who have um, patients who are infect infected with GC, they can call into the pharmacy for an order of ceftriaxone and azithromycin. When the partners show up, they, are, they get the injection by a pharmacy RN, and they're giving, given the uh, azithromycin, they have to take it right there. And part of the benefit, I think, that uh, providers really like is that since they're being seen at a pharmacy, they're getting fully assessed for drug allergies, they're getting um, assessed for contraindications, they're getting counseling messages, they're getting condoms, they're getting written materials, <laughs> they're, getting, they're getting the whole shebang. Wow. And um, uh, so far, uh, this has only been in place for a couple of months now, but so far we've had quite a few um, uh, people sent in there for uh, for injections of ceftriaxone. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we'll um, we'll be getting a lot of data uh, with this, and hopefully, I have enough uh, maybe at the NCSD meeting to to share kind of how it's going and uh, what the uptake is. That's a great model, and thank you for sharing that. I, I think Washington State has done some work with pharmacies that has, has been really successful where the health department pays for the cost of medication. Right. But then the pharmacist, you know, actually provides the service and the medication. And I don't, I can't remember if they were using injectable medication. Do you know? Or is that a novel thing that you're doing in Alaska? Yeah, I think they were using cefixime. Hi, and this is Lena. From Washington, yeah, we only use the fix in our pharmacies. Is there? Okay. A, I'm, I'm glad you're on. Thank you. Is there a barrier to pharmacists doing injectable medications? In we Washington don't have a lot of pharmacies here that have pharmacists that will do anything besides immunizations. Okay. Um, so we have about 350 sites statewide, pharmacists and clinics that we provide EPT meds for, and then we have them bill us for the cost of dispensing. So the money, is, it's completely free for our patients. That's fantastic. Yeah, this particular pharmacy is an infusion pharmacy, so they do a lot of IV uh, drugs, they do a lot of chemo, things like that. So they were already set up. They have an, an, uh, a registered nurse on duty who, uh, who is able to uh, administer injectables. And uh, for people who are out, the partners who are outside of the Anchorage area and can't come in for that, uh, they do mail out. And in, in that case, it's uh, the cefixemin and the azithromycin. Did you have to go through statute to get um, all of this hammered out for both Alaska and Washington? I mean, this, you know, mailing, mailing stuff and having pharmacists be allowed to give injections on site or were these you just used? 
statutes that already allowed for certain things? Uh, Alaska has a, uh, a real absence of a lot of those regulations and statutes um, that uh, that would have, um, I think, in other states would have prohibited a lot of uh, what we we're working on because everything that we've done in terms of EPT uh, has pretty much been um, allowable and. Um, you know, there just weren't anything on the, uh, there weren't any statutes on the books prohibiting it. Same in Washington. We didn't go through the act of doing any WACs or any legislature changes. Mm. Um, Matt Golden really paved the way for working with the pharmacy board, um, just getting approval that way. But there's nothing on the books in Washington State that says that this is legal or not legal. It's um, mainly up to just the pharmacy board's ruling that this would be acceptable in our state. Yeah, the, the other thing that we did to um, uh, make this uh, pharmacy-based uh, injection, um, uh, administration of injections uh, uh, a little bit more, oh, uh, oh, I don't know what the word is. Um, anyway, we got standing orders through our section chief that the DIS are able to call in prescriptions. So they now have prescription writing authority hmm. under his license. Wow. And so uh, so some of the referrals over to the pharmacy are, are actually by our DIS, referring partners over there and uh, getting them the, the proper medications. You said it's under the medical license of, of whom? Uh, our section chief. Wow. Yeah. In Washington, every health officer for the local health jurisdiction gives rights in their county to their, their DIS. What was that last thing from the Washington person? Um, our, our, at our local health jurisdictions, the health officers there uh, have standing orders in each county that talk to, about their nursing staff or their DIS within their county to go ahead and prescribe or mail medications out to um, patients. For EPT or for anything that any STD related treatment? For EPT. I see. So some jurisdictions have the capacity or the availability and some don't? Right. So there are certain counties that don't do EPT at all just because they don't have STD staff. Uh -huh. And so at the state level, we'll interview their patients and go ahead and call prescriptions in on their behalf. So it's not really done by private providers as much. It really is more of a public health mm -hmm. um, program. It's about half and half. We uh, most a lot of our bigger counties, like King County, will their DIS are taking care of a lot of the EPT. But especially in our rural counties, um, we've worked a lot with the healthcare providers there to utilize EPT for their patients. Great. And there's also a lot of going back to the evaluation question. Washington State has really taken a leadership role in doing pretty intensive evaluation, and I, I'm not sure if you want to mention sort of um, what's been going on with that and, and whether that would be feasible for other jurisdictions to embark on similar strategies. Uh, Matt, Matt Golden, when he did the EPT trials here, he was funded by the National Institutes of Health, and so he really had a five-year um, study and so inside of his own county, which is King County, they had been doing EPT since the late 90s. So he rolled it out in the rest of Washington State, and it's been really, really successful. Um, but again, he got special funding that allowed him to do that study. Right. And I think for a lot of other places, it, that's just, it's just too much. The cost is, is staggering. Yeah, I know Matt has really strong feelings about sort of just, you know, making it very widely available and sort of doing the math on how many partners are out there and and that, you know, public health should really be funding this. And I think it's intriguing to think about, you know, what might be the impact of a very large scale, you know, EPT initiative where we really are funding drugs for chlamydia and gonorrhea cases. In California it would be significant chunk of change, yeah. <laughs> but maybe other other jurisdictions it might be more, more feasible. 
Would you, can, here's a question, and I, this, does, this is not specifically relevant for the GC issue, but for EPT in general. Is EPT, does anyone know if EPT is being done more in states that bill for STD services than in states that don't, or is there, is there no correlation whatsoever? Hmm. I have no idea. I'm going to kick that question to NCSD, folks that are working on this issue nationally. Have you seen a correlation? Hi, this is Hannah. Um, I haven't really seen anything too direct. I mean, where EPT is explicitly prohibited, for example, in West Virginia, they also do not have EPT. Um, so I think because so many states allow it, it's not as related as, as we would think. I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in on that. Yeah, I think it sort of brings up the issue of just the fact that, you know, one of our biggest barriers in California is no one wants to pay for it, it seems like. And um, Medi-Cal, Medicaid, you know, any of the federal entitlement programs have been, been pretty explicit about um, really, again, wanting to ensure that the partner is eligible for the program and enrolled in the program before they receive any program benefits. And even with um, 340B funds, there's been sort of ongoing controversy around how public patients are defined and how you really prove that if you're going to use, um, you know, 340B programs to purchase PDPT meds. And in California, Kaiser, which is a pretty big managed care organization covering, you know, a third of residents in Northern California, they were big proponents of changing the law to make EPT allowable. And mm -hmm. shortly after it was passed into legislation, their, their legal counsel essentially wrote a letter saying that they supported in principle, but they, you know, they told people not to send partners to the Kaiser Pharmacy. So even, even they don't want to pay for it, even though they were big proponents. They're, they're fine with people writing prescriptions, but they don't want to fill those prescriptions. So it's been it's been really challenging to, you know, figure out, you know, who besides public health S T D programs um, is willing and able to purchase medication and or reimburse for EPT. And I don't know if anybody has overcome that issue in any project area, but I'd love to hear about it if you've made progress. And you know, Washington oh, go ahead. Yeah, in Washington. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> in Washington State, one of our biggest providers is Group Health, and um, the when EPT stopped being a National Institutes of Health grant, and the state took on the cost of EPT, um, they uh, Group Health agreed to cover the cost of the medication if we would provide the actual packet with the information about gonorrhea and chlamydia in it. So now we ship to them the packs and they go ahead and fill with their medication and they cover the dispensing fee, but only for their patients. They won't do it for um, partners of their patients. But that's been a big, uh, a big success because so many of the people in our state use Group Health for their insurance. So they could use it in a situation where the partner is enrolled in the same plan as right. the patient. Got it. I think yeah, that when the military was talking about rolling it out, they had that caveat that uh, there was some there was some requirement that seemed like it would not be um, common <laughs> to have that be the situation. But maybe with Group Health or Kaiser, it's a little different. I think for young people, it's much more of a challenge. Yeah, with our uh, pharmacy-based. Uh, EPT program, uh, we're, we were lucky enough to be awarded uh, some funds from the state legislature uh, for three years. We just finished the first year, so we've got two more years, and um, uh, with that we're uh, funding the whole pharmacy-based EPT. Uh, and one of the benefits to going through an established pharmacy, too, is that the partners who come in to get their medications who have insurance, the pharmacy can bill the insurance. And uh, if they don't have insurance or if they have a copay, the state picks up the tab. Mm. But that'll run out in two more years. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do after that. <laughs> Interesting. That's great. 
Okay, we're approaching or maybe just a couple minutes over our deadline. Anyone else? Last comments or questions for Dr. Bauer? Yeah, this is Rich in Illinois. Heidi, how do you deal with private physicians who feel like it's a, a liability to use EPT, and how do you convince them that EPT is safe? Yeah, that's a great question, and it's all it's it's interesting how it's still ongoing. Some of the concerns about you know not just the liability thing, but you know is this really the right thing to do? Is it is it the highest quality patient care? And and there's a lot of those concerns. And I think you know I have to say the climate's changed. When I first started talking about EPT, I just got looks of horror and shock. And how can you even propose this? And and now it's a little more commonplace. And so I think it. I think it changes over time, and in medicine in particular, community practice standards really change the shape of, of practice everywhere, and sometimes it just takes a while for that to diffuse. But as people use it, as they realize that their patients appreciate it, that they may even anecdotally notice their patients are you know, less likely to come back in infected, um, then I think they're, they're comforted by that. Um, there have been no lawsuits in California um, since, you know, related to EPT since the, the law was passed for chlamydia, and there have been no adverse reactions. And I think, you know, the other thing I'll throw out, I've never tried this, but you could always sort of push the flip side and say, you know, it's a liability to not get the partners treated. And I think we have California law that specifies that providers have an obligation to make a good faith effort to get partners treated. And for the most part, that means they just tell the patients, be sure and tell your partner to go in and get tested and get treated, which is probably not as much as they should be doing and could be doing. And so I think, you know, they have a liability to their patients to prevent reinfection. If this is a proven evidence-based strategy to prevent reinfection, prevent complications, they should be implementing it, um, and it's you know recommended nationally by the CDC and in various states that have EPT allowable. And so I think that's that's kind of the only counter. But there's always going to be people who opt out, who just are not comfortable doing it. And at least until a lot of their colleagues are doing it and they feel that pressure, they're just going to have that resistance. So I don't know if that's helpful. Just being patient and trying to explain the different um, key points has sort of been my strategy. Hi, this is Bernard in South Carolina. Um, got kind of a comment here, and, and you got to take it with a grain of salt, if you will. Uh, how much do you think EPT kind of distorts the actual morbidity of a jurisdiction? Um, here in, in the South, we tend to spend a disproportionate amount of money testing people and trying to get people in and burning resources, uh, trying to confirm that they are a case or not a case or they're infected or not infected, where a lot of the western or northern states, um, they implement things like EPT and, and creative ways to manage people without really being concerned for um, the true burden of disease or morbidity. Um, and you know, EPT is illegal in South Carolina, um, and, and it's, it would be a real hard legislative push to get it legal, but we do have what we call field-delivered therapy where we follow up on persons who are positive and kind of have issues or difficulty in coming back um, for treatment that otherwise would go untreated with a positive test on record. Uh, so, you know, back to the, the distortion of morbidity um, issue. Yeah, it's a great question. And I, you know, I think you're right. If we're, if those cases that are being treated are not being reported, we may sort of get an underestimate of, of morbidity. Um, and I, the only, the only counter to that would be is if you're really using it as a last resort, those folks probably wouldn't be counted either way. And I think there are a lot of clinic situations where if that person presented, they may not get tested. They may just get treated presumptively. And in that situation, you're not going to get them into the surveillance system either. But I think, you know, I, I think it, if it were really widespread and everyone was using it, then, you know, theoretically you would see um, an underestimate of case counting. I don't, I don't think that's a reason to not do it 
because you know I think that's I think surveillance is important, but I think getting partners treated is more important than surveillance. <laughs> right, absolutely, and I agree. That's why I said take it with a grain of salt because it's going to probably come <laughs> off like um, we didn't want PPT or or any sort of treatment without counting uh, whether a person's affected or not. We're not. Yeah, I think you raise a really good point, and just I think it's something to keep in mind as sort of this is this is sort of a downside. Yeah, and it's interesting that in a new FOA, they kind of target um, the disease rate or burden in a particular population, affecting funding, you know, through the formulary and stuff. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Okay, well, I think we are a, a little bit over. Heidi, thank you so much for your talk. Oh, my pleasure. Um, thank you for inviting great. me. Great. And, and everyone else on the phone, thank you for participating. I think it was another great call. Please have a safe uh, 4th of July, and um, look forward to talking with you on the next call. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Heidi. Thanks, Dana. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Please stand by.